Welcome to this virtual Cap Times Idea Fest session. Our session is entitled Unleashing Atomic Energy, Moving from Oppenheimer to Theranostics. My name is Howard Bailey. I'm a cancer physician and researcher and the director of the UW Health Carbone Cancer Center, and I will host this session. We have three world leaders uh, in the growing field of Theranostics, two from the university and one from a world leading technology company right here in our own area. At UW Health Carbone Cancer Center, we are proud of advancing phenomenal research in cancer into outstanding cancer patient care, both here in Wisconsin and locally. And today we're going to talk about Theranostics and principally the, it's radio Theranostics, which is the joining together of molecular imaging with targeted radionuclide therapy, and thus the name of Theranostics, which is joining together of therapy and diagnostics together in one name. I will introduce our speakers in just a bit. Uh, they are Dr. Jamie Weikert, Dr. Zachary Morris, and Dr. Greg Piper. After they speak, we will have a panel discussion and go over some of the questions that we've heard from audiences in the past. So again, welcome to our session, and we will get started. Our first speaker is Professor Jamie Weikert, who is a professor of radiology, medical physics, and pharmaceutical sciences here at the University of Wisconsin, and the founder of multiple companies with more than 50 patents, and also the leader of experimental cancer imaging at the Carbone Cancer Center. Dr. Weikert, please. Uh, thanks, Howard. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today to share with everybody what we're doing here at the UW Carbone Cancer Center. So I'm gonna set the stage for today's discussion uh, around some of our precision medicine studies, which include uh, theranostics. So as we all know, there are several approaches to uh, treating cancer. Uh, surgery, very effective uh, if tumors are detected early, uh, but we do need to know the prior uh, location of tumors to be able to treat them effectively uh, to do surgery. And then external beam radiotherapy can deliver high radiation doses precisely to tumors uh, virtually anywhere in the body, uh, can be extremely effective, uh, but relies on knowing again where the tumor or tumors are before radiation. Uh, chemotherapy is typically systemic in nature, so you don't really need to know the precise tumor location, uh, and you can treat multiple tumors simultaneously. The majority of chemo agents, however, are not selective for tumor cells, so balancing tumor response and normal tissue toxicity uh, is the challenge and a limiting factor. Recently, immunotherapy uh, has seen great success. It is systemic in nature, and new approaches have improved patient outcomes significantly, even in difficult to treat cancer types, as long as the patient's cancer possesses the correct immunological profile to be responsive. So prior knowledge of tumor location, in this case for immunotherapy, is not necessary. So Theranostics, as Howard said, has gained much attention lately because like chemo, it does not rely on prior tumor location and is systemic in nature. It's not necessary to know the location and number of tumors prior to treatment. So Theranostics, uh, the topic of today's uh, presentation here, typically utilizes molecularly targeted radiation to image tumor location and metastatic spread and treat the same tumors by utilizing a therapeutic radioisotope. So we first uh, use an imaging isotope attached to the molecule to determine the number and location of tumors and then follow with a radiotherapy version of the molecule for treatment. This technique is only as good as the ability of the carrier molecule to selectively target tumors. And of course, uh, currently today, combinations of all of the above uh, are also employed to optimize patient response. So my role uh, is to design molecules that selectively localize in tumor cells while minimizing uptake in normal cells. So I'm gonna share with you a little fun fact. Uh, there, are current, there, are, there are over a billion biochemical reactions occurring every second in our bodies. 
per cell. This correlates to about 37 billion trillion reactions occurring in our body every second. So our challenge then is to find and exploit a biochemical reaction or pathway or molecular target, such as a receptor, that is unique to cancer cells. At UW, we have multiple theragnostic focused faculty who identify and exploit these unique cancer biochemistry pathways. Uh, and we are extremely um, fortunate to have a very so strong cyclotron group uh, right down the hallway from our labs here at UW that can actually make a variety of imaging and therapy isotopes, as well as both Shine Medical and North Star uh, companies uh, located in Janesville and Beloit, respectively, capable of making commercial amounts of theranostic isotopes to supply this rapidly expanding cancer treatment field. So along with GE in Waukesha, who's also growing its theragnostic focus, the state of Wisconsin is positioned to play a major role in improving the lives of cancer patients. At UW, we also have specialized radiochemistry labs for synthesizing new molecular imaging and theranostic molecules and a new and unique analytical lab called the Razor Lab dedicated to storing and analyzing radioactive tissues. We are also very fortunate to have Worf, uh, who guides the IP and in many cases provides drug development expertise and resources to ensure that promising new agents can actually advance to clinical trial stage and, and ultimately into patients. Uh, we currently have several new theranostic radiopharmaceuticals uh, nearing the clinical trial stage. So to summarize theranostics and its role in precision medicine, uh, first, a cancer unique biochemical reaction pathway or target is identified for exploitation. A molecule is designed to exploit the unique pathway or target and then the molecule is radio labeled with an imaging isotope first to quantify its organ uh, distribution and clearance properties uh, in tumor bearing mice. And if warranted in <clears throat> cancer patient dogs in collaboration with the UW School of Veterinary Medicine. So promising agents, those that show tumor selectivity and hopefully prolonged retention in tumor cells relative to normal cells, are radio labeled with a radioactive therapy isotope, the dose of which is optimized previously by imaging dosimetry. Uh, so by quantitative imaging, we can actually determine the appropriate dose to give each patient. So imaging assesses location and number of tumors and permits a dose prescription to optimize the therapy dose to each patient's cancer type and severity. So hopefully with this background, uh, understanding of how molecular tumor targeting is used to select appropriate patients. So in other words, if we inject the imaging agent and we saw no tumor uptake for some reason, we would not follow on with a therapy dose. So we can identify appropriate patients here uh, and provide patient specific dosing of therapeutic radiopharmaceuticals. Uh, so this is a very great example of precision medicine uh, at its best. So Zach will, will go into more details of how we can combine theranostic agents with external beam radiotherapy and immunotherapy to further improve the response rates against advanced cancers. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Weikert. We will now move uh, to hear from Dr. Zachary Morris, who is the chair and Paul Harari Professor of Human Oncology, and is also the co-director along with Dr. Weikert of the Initiative of, Towards Theranostics and Particle Therapy in the UW Carbone Cancer Center and the UW School of Medicine and Public Health. Dr. Morris, please. Yeah, uh, thanks Howard. Uh, really appreciate the opportunity to chat here today. Uh, it's an honor to uh, be here with this esteemed panel and uh, uh, appreciate the opportunity to uh, present here with Jamie and Greg. So uh, thanks to our audience, our listeners and viewers for uh, joining here with us. Um, 
uh, welcome to the Idea Fest and this session on Theranostics. Uh, as Jamie mentioned, uh, Theranostics is a really exciting emerging and growing area in uh, cancer imaging and treatment. And there's a number of opportunities that we see here, uh, both from a research as well as a clinical treatment standpoint for cancer patients. <clears throat> as Jamie alluded to, um, radiation therapy is a standard treatment for many patients with cancer. Um, and the images shown here are what are called a linear accelerator. This is the uh, workhorse uh, device that we use for the treatment of most patients who get radiation for their cancer. And uh, the majority of patients who have cancer actually do get radiation at some point in time during their treatment. About 60% about of cancer patients will, will receive radiation as part of their cancer care. So it has an enormous role in uh, the care of patients, and it's uh, well-established as part of not only potentially curative treatments for cancer, where we combine it with surgery and, and in some cases chemotherapy, or in some cases we deliver radiation alone, but it's also has an important role in alleviating symptoms and controlling pain for patients uh, whose cancers we can't cure, but where we can uh, improve their quality of life. <clears throat> Those devices de deliver radiation in the form of x-rays, but there's a number of different types of radiation that can potentially be used uh, for radiation therapy. And in addition to x-rays, some of those uh, include sources that come from natural substances, things found in the earth, uh, isotopes that can be isolated or produced, and which may emit a form of radiation, often in the form of a particle, such as an alpha particle or a beta particle, or in the form of a natural x-ray called a gamma ray. And it's been known for uh, many years that these types of radiation can also be used for treatment of cancer. Radiation is, in fact, one of our oldest types of cancer treatment modalities. It's been used uh, for more than 100 years, uh, second only to surgery in, the, in terms of how long we've used it to treat cancer. And uh, since that time, uh, when with the discovery of radium by Madame Curie, uh, these natural sources of radiation have been used uh, for such treatments. And so the, the idea of using uh, these isotopes to deliver radiation to cancer cells is not new per se, but what has changed recently is our ability to deliver those isotopes to the tumor precisely. And Jamie touched on this, but just to give a little more uh, illustration of the idea, what we're talking about here is using a small molecule, or in some cases, an antibody, which is a protein that can specifically target another protein. Uh, in the drawing here, that's shown in the black, delivering a radioisotope to a tumor by targeting a specific receptor or protein on the surface of a cancer cell. And the more specific that targeting is, the more specific that drug will be. And so when we think about developing a new Theranostic, there's a couple things we, we need to consider. One is, what are we going to target and how are we going to target? Do we have a, a, a small molecule or protein uh, or peptide or antibody that might bind to it? And then what is the payload that we're going to deliver with that? And in that case, often we're delivering a specific uh, radioisotope. And Greg will talk more about the supply and production of those isotopes for these types of drugs. So we want something that's tumor specific. We want it expressed on the tumor cells and hopefully not expressed or minimally expressed on normal tissues. And then we'd like it to be taken up and retained in that cancer cell. And if this isotope gives off a form of radiation that can be imaged, then we can use this for imaging. And that's where the diagnostic in imaging comes in. And if it gives off a form of radiation, like the forms we talked about, alpha or beta particles or a gamma ray, then we can also use it for therapy to uh, destroy those cancer cells that are targeted by this. And shown here on the right side then is an image uh, illustrating how we can use these forms of uh, theranostics to image, as, as Jamie said, a patient. And we can use this to help guide the selection of which patients might get a given uh, treatment because it will show us which for which patients their tumor takes up the agent and how much it takes up that agent. And by quantifying how much, we can actually calculate then potentially how much of the drug we need to give in order to have a treatment effect. 
So as I mentioned, theranostics are not necessarily new. In fact, we have a number of them that are already approved for clinical use. Uh, but there, this is a, hopefully a growing list. Uh, we've seen a number of approvals in the last few years, and there's a really large growing pipeline in pharmaceutical industry of potential new agents that are being tested now in clinical trials or developed in preclinical research settings in the hopes of bringing them to clinical trials. Diseases that we treat currently with uh, theranostics include thyroid cancer, prostate cancer, certain forms of lung cancer, and certain forms of pediatric tumors known as neuroblastoma. Just to show some of the clinical potential here, these are results from a randomized clinical trial that was done in patients with metastatic castrate-resistant prostate cancer. This is a form of prostate cancer that has spread throughout the body and is at a relatively late stage. And in this study, they compared a drug known as Pluvicto, which delivers an isotope, lutetium-177, with a small molecule targeting prostate-specific membrane antigen to prostate cancer uh, tumors throughout a patient's body. And they compared it to the alternative standard of care treatment that these patients might have otherwise gotten. And shown on this graph are the, the months that these patients survived after treatment and the percentage of patients who were surviving at, at that time. And what this study showed, as you can see here, is the patients in blue who received the theranostic agent lived longer after getting that agent than the patients who are shown in red, this population, who received the alternative standard of care. And so while it's promising and it shows the potential, there's a very clear survival benefit, statistically significant survival benefit from this drug. It's also a bit humbling in that we see, unfortunately, still most of these patients do uh, progress and develop additional sites of disease. And so it also shows the need for further research. And this is where I think there's a lot of excitement because of the potential to continue to innovate with theranostics, not only to develop new agents, but also to partner these with existing approaches to cancer treatment. And that excitement is part of what's giving rise to the expectations of rapid growth in this field of theranostics. This is an area on the industry side where we're seeing enormous investment and the hope is that that investment is going to translate into improvements in care for cancer patients in the years to come. But this is a rapidly growing industry, and Greg is a part of that, and I'm sure he can speak more to the potential, uh, because this is uh, a really um, large footprint of theranostics in industry here in the state of Wisconsin, as Jamie mentioned. It's a, it's a strength for our state as a whole, not only on the academic, but on the industry side. One of the areas that excites me most about this is the opportunity to take theranostics and combine them with our other forms of cancer therapy. And one of the studies we did working with Jamie's group in a preclinical setting was to combine a low dose of a theranostic agent with an immunotherapy. Immunotherapies are treatments that try to get a patient's own immune system to attack their cancer. And one of the things we showed here is if we gave uh, a control treatment in this experimental system, it was not very effective. If we gave immunotherapy alone, uh, it was not very effective. If we gave a theranostics agents alone, which is in the red curve here, it was somewhat effective, but didn't cure these uh, the, these um, mice. But if we combined these, we were actually able to cure about 60%. And so this is where I'm hoping that we will see the, some of the biggest impact on our cancer patients is when we combine these theranostics with other approaches to cancer treatment, where we move from improving the duration of survival to hopefully offering curative potential. So in closing, I'll just speak to some of the really outstanding opportunities and strengths we have here at the University of Wisconsin and in the state of Wisconsin. The University of Wisconsin has really well-recognized expertise and state-of-the-art internationally renowned resources related to theranostics for new agent discovery, for isotope production and, and the radiochemistry to take these isotopes and put them on drugs, for preclinical testing to test out new drugs and evaluate their efficacy using their uh, imaging capabilities to determine how to dose them. We have top ranked programs in here for medical physics and biochemistry, which are kind of engines behind this, as well as radiation oncology and uh, radiology nuclear medicine for testing these approaches. We have established pathways that Jamie alluded to for taking things from preclinical to testing, sometimes in people's pet dogs or pets who get cancer, where we can test these agents in that population and learn 
and also offer free treatments for those animals and then bringing these to early phase clinical testing at the Carbone Cancer Center. Wharf Therapeutics is an enormous uh, opportunity, sorry, an enormous uh, resource for us here and expands our opportunities by bringing uh, uh, dollars to take uh, new promising agents uh, from promising to clinical trial. And we have uh, through the Cancer Center and UW Health programs of excellence and distinction in theranostics for the actual care of cancer patients. We've been very successful in bringing uh, federal grant dollars to the state to uh, invest in this, and we look to partner with our industry partners across the state uh, for this type of translational research effort. So a lot of promise and opportunity and a lot of uh, really outstanding opportunities that are specific here in the state of Wisconsin because of our strengths. So with that, I'll close and uh, happy to pass it back to you, Howard, for Greg. Thank you, Dr. Morris. Uh, we will now uh, move to our next speaker, Dr. Greg Pfeiffer, who is a nuclear engineer in training, but it more, most importantly is the founder and CEO of Shine Technologies, which he has developed into literally a world leader in the production of radiolicans for medical purposes and diagnostic purposes. And we will now turn it over to uh, Dr. Pfeiffer for his session. Thank you, Greg. Thanks a lot, Howard, uh, and, and happy to be part of this panel. I think, um, to, to Zach's point, we're at the very beginning of this frontier of Theranostics and just starting to tap the potential uh, of, of what we can do with Theranostics alone, let alone, I think, the future potential for combined therapy, which, which I think, hopefully looking 20 years out from now, you know, we are looking at a significant number of cures in patients. So the uh, field is really exciting and, and just awesome for us to be a part of it. Talking a little bit more about uh, our company, you know, I we Shine was actually founded to change the way humans make energy, uh, and and we're focusing on a way to do that uh, known as nuclear fusion. But I think um, based on my education at the UW and a fusion engineering program, you know, my my view was that um, it was very challenging uh, to to not not necessarily prove the science of fusion, but to prove that fusion could be made cost effective uh, in a in a short period of time, and and just to be kind of um, talking a little bit more about that. Uh, we, you know, fusion is, it works, you can do it today. Um, but if you wanna make net energy, uh, we haven't proven we can do that yet. So we've gotten close to making net energy, but not quite um, a controlled reaction that can make net energy. But even more, if you look at the economics of fusion, we're nowhere close uh, to making economic positive fusion energy. And just as an example, you need to be able to sell fusion uh, energy for five cents uh, per kilowatt hour to be competitive with other energy generating technologies. We at Shine realized fairly early on that fusion also makes other particles of value. So on the one hand, it makes energy. On the other hand, it makes particles called neutrons that can be used uh, to access various markets. And some of those markets had economic potential of as much as $100,000 for that same kilowatt hour of fusion production. Okay, so how does all this tie in uh, to radioisotopes? Well, our belief is that we can use fusion to access larger and larger markets over time. Uh, and by accessing those markets, we'll get better at it and we'll be able to reduce the cost. Uh, and so I have a cost curve um, right here, which kind of shows our, this is like 20 to 30 years of business plan. They're essentially decreasing the cost of fusion over time. Uh, and in doing so, we can use the fusion reaction to access larger and larger markets. Okay, so what does all this mean? It essentially means there's a linear path through improving fusion technology and decreasing its cost. Uh, and then a, what looks like a nonlinear path through different markets that can take advantage of fusion as we scale it. Uh, so we have already commercialized fusion, nuclear fusion, for the purpose of doing neutron-based testing. Uh, and we've, we've learned to produce fusion neutrons cheaply enough to replace nuclear research reactors as the primary means of doing things like neutron radiography and red hardness, radiation hardness testing. We've actually, our theory is proven true. Uh, we've been able to reduce the cost of fusion sufficiently at this point that we can achieve the next market of scale. Uh, so beyond testing, we can use fusion neutrons to change materials. Uh, and in particular, we're changing materials from what I'll call low value forms to what I'll call hyper value uh, forms. 
Uh, and the most important markets for these are these theranostic markets uh, that we've been talking about so far. So we can use neutrons to turn uranium that's worth $6 a gram into a diagnostic agent that's worth $200 million per gram, something called molybdenum-99. We can use neutrons to turn ytterbium-176 uh, into a, theranost or a therapy isotope, lutetium-177, that's worth $1 to $2 billion per gram. So we had to get the cost of fusion down to a few hundred dollars uh, per kilowatt hour uh, to do this, uh, but that technology has been demonstrated. And so that's where we're spending the vast majority of our time and money right now. Uh, there's a facility you can see through the window behind me, uh, which will be the largest medical isotope production facility in the world, and it'll take advantage of fusion neutrons. Again, the thesis um, of this business being very similar to our previous phase where Historically, this was the domain of nuclear fission reactors. We've now achieved fusion at a cost profile that makes us competitive or even advantaged uh, over fission reactors. So uh, our four phases that we talk about are really, again, just a linear path to reducing the cost of fusion, increased complexity of fusion systems as we scale, um, but different markets as we as we move forward. Um, phase one being commercial and growing, essentially we're the dominant producer there. Phase two is now scaling, so we are producing isotopes now, uh, and we expect within sort of five to ten years to be uh, a major player in recycling nuclear waste and then ultimately delivering fusion energy as a commercial venture to humans. Uh, so over time, we plan to build one of the most impactful and important companies in human history, uh, but right now very much focused on, on phases one and two where we have absolutely proven the technology. So, and just a couple pictures of facilities, you know, where we're operating. Uh, this is our imaging facility located in Fitchburg. We do a lot of defense imaging here. Um, this is building one where we've got the brightest fusion neutron source in the world. Just to compare it to other technologies, about 10,000 times brighter uh, and far more cost-effective than other fusion-based neutron sources. Uh, and this is our systems and manufacturing capability. So we have developed the capability of building these systems in-house. Um, so really, you know, playing to this hub that Wisconsin is not just a leader in technology development, which it is, but it's also got an amazing advanced uh, manufacturing base. Uh, and certainly we are part of that. Uh, and then really focusing on our isotope production facilities. So this is the largest um, Cassiopeia here, the largest uh, lutetium-177 production facility in the Western Hemisphere. This is probably the most important near-term therapy isotope. Uh, it's the basis of approximately 100 ongoing clinical trials. It is the kill agent um, that, that Jamie and Zach had been talking about. Uh, but importantly, this facility is very adaptable. Uh, and as new isotopes are developed and potentially show more promise down the road, I will be able to, to be a leader, particularly in neutron-based isotopes going forward. Uh, and then finally, uh, the chrysalis facilities I mentioned, this is the one you see in the window behind me, will be able to produce about 20 million doses of, of medicine every year. Uh, again, you know, using our, our our non-reactor uh, fusion-based neutron engine uh, for transmutation of isotopes. So all of this right here, this represents sort of uh, close to a billion dollars worth of work at this point, uh, not quite, uh, but uh, this facility should be coming online in the next couple of years. And that'll absolutely put Wisconsin, not just at the forefront of US isotope production, but global isotope production. Uh, this will be the most flexible and the largest capacity isotope production facility in the world uh, as it comes online. So that's kind of a brief intro to Shine. Um, you know, I, I would say that, you know, super excited to be working with the UW. Uh, we, we provide actually the TCM to you guys, you probably know, but for everyone else, uh, almost weekly now, and, and um, it's, been a, it's been a great partnership and Really excited to play a role in future isotopes like Terbium-161 and, and evangelize like crazy about the future of this space because, you know, as Zach mentioned, it's early. We've got, we've got some challenges to overcome, but I think we're just starting to tap the potential of what we can do for cancer patients. So with that, I'm going to turn it back to you, Howard. Thank you, Dr. Pfeiffer. Again, thank you uh, all of our uh, uh, panelists for the information and updates. And so we're going to Go over a few things, uh, questions that I've been asked from the public in the past related to this area. <clears throat> start with um, maybe anybody can answer, but I'll start with uh, Dr. Morris. Could you kind of further explain the pros and cons of an external beam radiation delivery versus 
the systemic delivery of radionuclides when it comes to cancer, uh, kind of the pros and cons of each approach? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's a great question, and it's one that we hear often. Um, and, and basically, I would say that they are uh, non-overlapping in, in many ways and not redundant in that they both have their roles. External beam uh, has been around for uh, many decades, and we use this to target individual tumors. But a key being that uh, in order to focus that radiation and deliver it in the most uh, low toxicity, high efficacy way, we need to be able to see the tumor, as, as Jamie alluded to. When we do that, we can use external beam to ablate or eliminate individual tumor sites. For patients with localized disease, this is really a standard of care type of approach. We use external beam either to get rid of a tumor uh, that we see or in combination with surgery to eliminate tumor cells that might be left behind in an area after a surgery. The other major role for external beam is when a patient has a particular symptom caused by one site. If there's a site that's causing pain, then we can radiate that site. And about 80% of the time, we'll have an improvement in the control of that pain. Often uh, can be even complete relief of that pain. Conversely, the Theranostics, they're given intravenously. So this is an agent that initially is not targeted or directly at, directed at a tumor, but it uses that biological or molecular selectivity to home in on a tumor. And it, it one of the advantages is we don't need to see that tumor site. And so it, it, because these are injected into the bloodstream, they'll go throughout the body and they can be taken up in tumor sites, whether they're large enough for us to see them or whether they're very small microscopic sites that might show up in the future that we don't currently see. Uh, and so in that way, it's similar to like how we might use a chemotherapy uh, to target all sites of cancer throughout the body. And so these have kind of non-redundant uh, roles, but they likely are going to be complementary because uh, they each have their limits. Radiation from an external beam has to go to the tumor and travel through the nearby organs. And so that's where the, the side effects or risks come from. Theranostics, because they go through the bloodstream, the off-target areas that can be affected that lead to side effects are the blood or the organs that get rid of these from the body that excrete them, like the kidneys. If, if a patient is going to pee this agent out, it's going to be excreted by the kidneys or the liver if it's going to leave um, through hepatic metabolism. And so those are what currently limit how much we can give. And if we recognize that those are not overlapping, then it makes sense that we likely can give both of these treatments in combination and stay below a toxicity limit, but give additional treatment to the patient's cancer. So I suspect what we're going to see is that these work better together than they do alone. Thank you, Zach. Uh, let me ask uh, Greg and Jamie as uh, uh, nuclear engineers and nuclear chemists, how do the radio ligands or radionuclides differ in terms of their physical properties or chemical properties and how that's important relative to how they're used medically? Jimmy, maybe you go first. Okay, thanks. Uh, <clears throat> so for imaging, you know, we need to, as I mentioned, you know, we need to design a, a, a carrier molecule that can target the tumor. For imaging, you know, the isotope uh, is different, uh, clearly, than a therapy isotope. Uh, many times, uh, longer, much longer range and lower energy for those isotopes. Um, you know, for imaging, we don't really need uh, prolonged tumor retention. You just need the, uh, you know, the molecule to deliver the isotope as quickly as possible to the tumor cells, uh, which helps with the, you know, the flow uh, in the clinic, get patients in and out quickly. Uh, and then in therapy, we do want the uh, tumor cells to retain the agent. Um, and of course, we put a therapy isotope on there, which typically will have much shorter range than an imaging because imaging you need to detect outside the body. Uh, we really don't need to detect uh, the therapy agent uh, outside the body. But, you know, in the case of lutetium-177, that's unique in the fact that it does both imaging and therapy all by itself. So uh, one injection will do both, uh, serve both purposes. So. The differences in the isotopes are, you know, there's isotopes uh, dedicated towards imaging and isotopes also dedicated for therapy. 
And, uh, you know, and that's the, that's the difference between them. But, you know, we have to come up with uh, unique ways of, you know, uh, delivering the molecules, delivering the therapy or imaging dose to tumor cells. So that's the big mm -hmm. challenge, but I think people are getting uh, pretty good at it now, so. Yeah, I'll, I'll focus a little bit more on the isotope and less on the drug. Um, and I'll st I'm still going to caveat this by saying biology is insanely complex. Uh, and so there is no truth here, only probability uh, in theory. You know, So there's a number of different, I think, really exciting areas, particularly in the therapy isotope space. Uh, there's really you know, a couple different forms that are being considered. There's beta emitters, as Zach mentioned those, alpha emitters, and even something called OJ electron emitters, all of which have a bit different characteristics. So betas typically travel on the order of a millimeter in human tissue. Uh, and so they're actually reasonably better potentially, or at least theoretically at irradiating solid tumors. So tumors that are big, and you want to get a lot of coverage over a bigger volume, betas tend to be better at that. And we see really good at least radiographic disease um, clearing uh, with sort of betas. So when you have to kill big things, betas seem to work really well, uh, but they're probably really kind of bad at killing small tumors. So what we either call micrometastases or cellular based cancers, that beta deposits its energy over a millimeter, but a small cell is a lot smaller than that. So you don't get a lot of energy deposited in that cell. And that's led to people to, to, to look a lot at alpha therapy, which is as it delivers a very high kill dose uh, to very small tumors, some micrometastases, but you might not get really good bulk tumor coverage. So if you have smaller tumors, uh, it may be more effective. It may be more effective for killing micrometastases, uh, but small doses of alpha can have really big side effects too. And I think the clinical trials ongoing now are gonna talk a little bit about, um, are gonna reveal, frankly, um, whether alphas have a, a toxicity issue. We're really excited about an isotope called terbium-161, uh, largely because it's got betas, which are bulk tumor coverage. It also emits OJ electrons, which are significantly higher energy deposition over shorter range. So it might be a magic bullet uh, that can do both. Um, and, and so we're investing in R&D there. We think that could be the way of the future, but uh, you know, again, I'll, I'll caveat by saying biology is complicated and we need clinical trials to show statistically how it's gonna happen. Thank you, Greg. Um, maybe follow up, Greg, with you on this. It's, we're mainly talking about cancer and we'll continue talking about it because that's what the research we all do. But what are your thoughts on the future of uh, radionuclides in diseases outside of cancer? Yeah, so radionuclides have already a wide range of applications in industry. Um, and they're used for sterilization, they're used for quality control, uh, they're used for batteries. Uh, and I think as we look at the future of the radioisotope space, it's gonna be cancer for the next five to 10 years. Um, but I think, you know, in terms of the bulk economic potential, but I think as you start to look outside of that, you can get really exciting potential uses of, of radioisotopes outside of cancer and growing. You know, as we do more stuff in remote locations, particularly areas like space, um, and then ultimately, I think you know, as we mentioned, our phase three focuses on nuclear energy. If we want, if we want carbon-free energy in this world, we need to have nuclear fission be a part of that solution. It's what we know now. It's the tool we know best, and one of the biggest resources for fission, and frankly, one of the most responsible things we need to do as a species is recycle our nuclear waste. So. If you look at recycling nuclear waste, for example, and consider that to be a use of radium, particularly plutonium, that's a space that could be 10 times the economic potential very easily of, of what we're talking about for radioisotopes for medicine. Uh, so you know, I think as you're thinking 10 years out and more as we try to create a carbon-free energy grid, um, radiochemistry and, and radionuclides will play a massive economic uh, role there. Thank you, Greg. Uh, Jamie and Zach, kind of, could you ex go into a little bit more on kind of the relative pros and cons of molecular imaging, which is uh, at the heart of Theranostics, relative to our standard techniques now, whether that's CT scanning, MRI, again, kind of the, the pros and cons of, uh, of each. I'll let you go first, Zach. Sure. Um, so with, with a lot of the standard imaging, what we get is a uh, image of the anatomy in a patient, and that will show us the size and shape and, and relative locations of tumors or normal tissues and organs. 
Uh, that's the case with CT scans and MRIs. With molecular imaging, what you uh, get is in addition to that, depending on where you target your molecular imaging agent, you get some functional output. Uh, you can look at, for example, the metabolism going on, how, how much glucose is being metabolized by those tissues. And so you get not only the anatomy, but you get how they're functioning, which are uh, high met met metabolizing like a tumor often is and which are you know, low uh, or, or dormant in their metabolism. But you can expand that to then, as we expand those what I called vectors, uh, agents that are targeting specific molecules, you can also look use this to label and see where is a given protein expressed across the body or where is a given receptor uh, binding to its ligands. And for a tumor, this gives you kind of functional information about that tumor, which could be used to pick a specific agent for a patient. So for example, if you had a drug that had a known target that it needed to hit in order to work, you could make an imaging agent of that target. So you wouldn't have to give the treatment first. You could give this imaging agent and say, okay, for this patient, these tumors have that target expressed. And so they will likely be receptive to that drug and respond. But for example, that patient might have one other tumor that doesn't show that because within a given patient, not all the tumors are exact clones of one another. And that would allow you to then say, well, we could give this agent, but for that one tumor that doesn't take this up, we need to do something else. And we could give, for example, external beam or some other form of treatment that would target that. So what I think ultimately these do is they give us more functional information and they will ultimately allow us to more personalize how we uh, address cancer for patients. I, I would just add, Howard, that you know, a lot of times in cancer imaging, we use hybrid scanning where we combine an anatomic uh, modality like CT or MRI uh, with a functional or, or isotope based uh, modality uh, like positron emission tomography or uh, SPECT imaging. So when you use those together, I mean, if we had the perfect imaging agent that only went to tumors, uh, we'd get a bunch of spots uh, 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 in an image field, but we wouldn't have a clue where they're at. So, uh, so you have to combine a, an anatomic modality like CT or MRI with the functional modality. And I would also just uh, add to what Zach said that, you know, we have the ability now to do four-dimensional mapping uh, very quantitatively. Uh, to assess the, you know, the distribution uh, of the theranostic agent or the therapy agent uh, inside the human body. And as Zach has said before, you know, that this, you know, every tumor is different. Every patient's tumors are different. So, you know, you really need to do, getting back to precision medicine here, this has to be individualized for each patient. So, Imaging by itself can do detection initially, and then we can do the theranostic therapy. And then we can actually come back and do imaging after that and do response assessment. So there's sort of three, three important uh, you know, roads there that imaging and theranostics play here in, in cancer management. So uh, that's all I would add to that. Thank you. I'm going to go to each of you, and uh, if you could either describe or present what you think are uh, interesting or really valuable future directions in kind of radiation or energy when it comes to uh, medicinal or therapeutic approaches, and uh, maybe start uh, with you, Jamie, and uh, then move forward. Okay, so a couple of things come to mind right away, Howard, and that is, you know, in, in the field of theranostics with radioactive uh, agents, um, Greg touched on this a bit, but, you know, they each have their own uh, strength with regard to tumor size. You know, betas are better for larger tumors, alpha is better for smaller uh, metastases and, and little tumorlets. Uh, but I think people are starting to look at combining alphas and betas together at the same time, <clears throat> or OJs, uh, and, and with that, you get the best of both worlds. You know, you can treat both large and small at the same time. And what, what really excites me now, Howard, and you're well aware of this, is another non-radioactive form 
uh, of Theranostics, which is now just coming to the surface uh, in the world climate here, and that is uh, neutron capture therapy. And of course, Greg knows a lot about neutrons, uh, but we, as as agent designers here, are super excited about this because you know, as these clinical neutron systems, uh, similar to clinical proton systems, are, are starting to appear. Right now, there are no such uh, clinical neutron systems in the United States. Uh, and, and as you know, Howard, we're hoping to become the first site uh, in, in North America on that. Uh, but the fact that you can literally turn on the radiation when, when a neutron hits a boron atom or a galenium atom. And so there's, there's no radioactivity until that low energy neutron uh, hits a boron, which presumably would be localized in a tumor cell. Uh, and when it gets hit by one of these neutrons, so think of it shining a flashlight through your head, you know, when you have a brain tumor, it pretty much goes, goes through unless it hits a boron or a galenium atom. When it hits a boron, it generates an alpha particle at the site of collision. Uh, and if it hits a galenium uh, atom, it creates an, an OJ electron at the site uh, of collision. So this is a, you talk about precision and no off target uh, damage here. This is the ideal way to approach it. And the, and the radio, radiation is turned on and off, you know, uh, by the location of the molecule. So we are getting really good at targeting tumors now. And I think this is a super exciting uh, future uh, cancer treatment. Uh, and I know Zach's really excited about it. And I know uh, Greg knows a lot about this. So I'd be, I'd be curious about their opinions on that. <laughs> Why don't we go to Greg next, and we'll close with Zach from kind of the clinical side. But Greg, your kind of sense of what are things ex even further exciting you about the use of these energy sources in uh, therapeutics? Yeah, I mean, I think, the like I said, the tip of the iceberg here, and I think the, the, the potential of these products is just insanely exciting. We're not doing any of the dose imagery in, in the clinic that Jamie and Zach were talking about today. So we don't do any dose planning. It's literally, you know, take two and call me in the morning for, for these therapeutic products today. Everyone gets the same dose regardless of disease uptake, et cetera. So I think as we start to do actual dose planning, the efficacy of these therapies is going to improve uh, significantly. So really hopeful that that's going to come really excited about that. And then I think even further, the idea of combination therapies, be it alpha, beta together. I mean, the thing that really gets me excited is what Zach talked about, right? Which is like finding the right radiotherapy to soften up the tumor environment and then bring in immunotherapy as, as the final kill and cure. I think that's going to be really, really amazing uh, frontier. To me, it, it's just like you're fighting an entrenched enemy in a war, right? You've got they're, they're deeply embedded. They've got good fortifications. You bring in this really advanced Air Force with this precision bombing. That's essentially radioligon therapy. Now you've softened them up and the, and the ground forces, the immune system can come in and clean up the rest, right? And so that, that, that analogy seems to be happening uh, in, in animal studies, small animal studies, at least very early. And if that extends to humans, I think we're going to go from an era of you know, just trying to fight disease progression to actually curing patients and maybe, maybe even vaccinations, you know, which is one of the things Zach told me they were seeing in small animals where I was just like, wow, a cancer vaccine, that's incredible. So, you know, I think that's that's really cool. Um, to comment on Jamie's part, uh, you know, on boron neutron capture, we're, we're neutron people, that's what we do. We're radiochemists, that's what we do. You know, we'll just keep uh, increasing the, the scale and decreasing the cost of neutron sources. And so if we start to see awesome effect from BNCT, I hope I hope that it's our engines ultimately producing the neutrons in the long term. So uh, really exciting uh, field there too. So um, really sky's the limit here. I'm super excited to just play a little role in it and to be working with people like Jamie and Zach that are leading the field. Thank you, Greg. Zach, uh, if you would go ahead and kind of close up for our session, your thoughts kind of as a cancer physician and researcher where all this is leading. Yeah, uh, well, I think uh, Jamie and Greg have set the table nicely. Uh, my uh, vision and optimism around the field is largely centered on the areas that they've touched on, which is, I think we are already seeing that Theranostics are improving the treatment for patients with cancer, but we're not yet seeing these lead to cures of incurable disease at, at 
you know, rates that would be uh, what we would wish for. <clears throat> but the opportunity is just absolutely enormous. And I think that we will get there. I do think that these are going to play a, a part of a curative regimen. <clears throat> and there's a number of ways to approach it. And I think, honestly, all the above are going to be important. We need more agent development. And with that, it's really critical to investigate the different isotopes that Greg has mentioned um, and the combinations that both Greg and Jamie have, Jamie have mentioned. I think there will be therapeutic advantages as we optimize and learn more about these. And research is the engine that's going to drive this. And then new approaches. You know, Greg is doing uh, fusion and fission. And, and as Jamie mentioned, uh, that can be a source of new isotopes that we can deliver. But when we do that, we're always going to be injecting radioactivity into the bloodstream. And so there's always going to be an upper limit in how much we can give. If we can give inert agents like boron and convert them to radioactive agents once they're in the tumor, we might eliminate that upper limit. And that's when these agents alone potentially could be curative. So that neutron capture therapy is really promising in, in my mind because of that, because of the ability to uh, further increase our, uh, our window between toxicity and how much uh, we can give to cure, uh, hopefully, these tumors. And then lastly, the combination and integration of these with other forms of cancer treatment like immunotherapy. That one in particular, I think, is where we are in the preclinical setting, seeing uh, unique synergies, and we're still learning a lot. You know, we're, we're recently looking at new data where the immune effects of the alpha particles that were discussed can in some cases be different than the immune effects of the beta particles. And we might use them differently clinically for different patient populations. And I'm really happy that we are going to have one of the first and I think one of the uh, most unique clinical trials here at the Carbone Cancer Center coming up that will open within the next year, combining these approaches uh, with a new form of a theranostic and a uh, immunotherapy. And so this is a type of treatment that uh, will be open to patients with almost any type of cancer diagnosis that are getting immunotherapies. But the, the potential impact here is enormous, but I do want to caution that it's going to take many years of research, both preclinical and clinical research, until it's ready for um, application. But but that's uh, a, a good place. It's better um, to be doing that and, and looking at this kind of promising future uh, than where we have been sometimes in the past. And so I think now we just need to see the uh, the research and you know, this is a great opportunity for folks out in the community to partner with us on this. It takes a lot of um, philanthropy and research support to the Cancer Center, and uh, you know we're we're looking to expand these efforts, and uh, more resources will allow us to get there faster. So, thank you. So, I'd like to thank our our panelists, Dr. Jamie Weicker, Dr. Zach Boris, Dr. Greg Pfeiffer. And on behalf of Shine Technologies, the University of Wisconsin, UW Health, and the UW Carbone Cancer Center, we really want to thank our audience for listening and uh, being involved with our session, which was Unleashing Atomic Energy, Moving from Oppenheimer to Theranostics. So again, on behalf of all of us, we appreciate your time and attention and have a great day. <laughs>